Hi everyone. Hi Nathan. Hi Hello. Nathan. Great to be Hi. here. Yeah, Thanks for having us. To be playing this lovely game once more. And what game is it you might ask? He said leaning dynamically towards and in, into and out of the microphone. So Nathan, tell screams. me, what game are we playing tonight? Well, Steve, thank you so much for asking. Uh, we are playing yet another episode. Or we're playing a game. Hmm. Playing an episode. You get it. The game we're playing is 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons. The show is is Reckless Attack. And what kind of show is it? Why, it's an actual play podcast. And I am your Game Master, Nathan, joined, as always, by the excellent players around the table here, starting with... Hi, everyone. I'm David. And I play Kaskrin Brightmane, the Dwarven Warlock. And I kind of wish that we had actually crashed all of these Raven Mounts so that I could be on the ground, because as it is, we're still flying. <laughs> well, d- yes, I guess depending <laughs> on what point in the fiction we want to pick up, you're either definitely we flying. Land. You could be immediately in the aftermath of looking for the maybe oh, you're right. once dead mango. <laughs> we did land, you're right. I understand how you blacked out yep. that horrific yep. moment from your, your brain was just protecting you. R.I.P. Mango. Yep. <laughs> Long live Mango. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I just completely forgot about uh, what happened. You, David, wow. blocked that out from your yeah. brain. <laughs> how could that be? <laughs> to my left. Hello, everyone. My name is Steve, and I am playing Selv Asterlin, the dragonborn monk, who I guess was flying and possibly falling with style, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, is now on the ground looking again for the remains of our dear departed mount friend, Mango. And across the table from me. Hi, everyone. I'm Sophie, and I play Valeska Carter, the human astro clerk of the Arcana Domain. And Val is super pissed at Checkers. Because <laughs> Val knows Checkers died. Or not Checkers, checkers Mango. Yeah. Checkers well, dead. Checkers is about was to about to die. Yeah. <laughs> but Val knows that Checkers sent Mango mm-hmm. to Mango's death. <laughs> yep, definitely. And then is now just pretending like everything's fine. <laughs> yep. With Mango being alive, but Val knows <laughs> physics, and like that does not work. And that frog was at terminal velocity, yeah, for sure, yeah, <laughs> for yeah, sure. Yeah. And Val's like, "There's magic happening here, and she's got to figure out what it is." <laughs> Hi, everyone. <laughs> Sophie just pointedly <laughs> glanced yeah. at Jonathan to be like, "I'm not saying shit." Right. You better start. <laughs> I'm Jonathan, and I am deeply afraid of Sophie right this moment, as I am playing checkers, the Grung Druid, and his trusty frog pals, Mango and Junior. His tr- no, his trusty frog pal. Val. Junior. Junior. <laughs> Only Junior. Mango just hides behind a tree at the withering glare of Valeska, just like... <laughs> the checkers. withering glare is not towards Mango. <laughs> Everyone, let's be clear. That's right, everyone. Well, before a frantic search for the remains of Frog, which is just not a fun sentence to say aloud, the party was on their way to a mysterious, what they have been told giant burial ground of some sort, which is the next stop on their journey. And you had a fancy raven mount kind of courier service that was taking you there. Certainly it's going to be like a lot safer than walking on the ground, for sure. Mm -hmm. (laughs) From some of the stuff we've seen in the air... I'm going to call it about maybe, maybe 55, 45. Mm, mm, See, yeah. Steve's got the right idea. Where the air is dangerous, and we should never go there again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you guys were attacked by wyverns, <laughs> is the takeaway. But, um, boy, was I hoisted by my DM petard last session. Because, boy, I really had a lot of the very intensive mechanics. There's like, oh, well, I have to perfectly craft all of these rules for if they're falling and uh, no, you just beat the fuck out of those would-be dragons, and it was just a delight. <laughs> you guys are able to not disconnect with your Raven Mountain escorts and are actually able to get a ride all the way to your next destination. It is still relatively light out, um, but again, the sun is certainly setting, 
And the raven mounts are actually turning around at this point. The group of you say your goodbyes. And there is an air of people seeing off heroes. As far as they are concerned, especially Juniper, they are seeing off a group of adventurers off to their next great mythic quest that is in the bowels of a mountain driven by a mystical riddle. And that's that's one of the coolest things that they've seen in quite some time. Juniper kind of gives one last wave and would have said before he left, remember, if they come back or you need anything, you let us know. It looks very serious, very solemn at you all. Thank you. Safe travels. We'll see you again soon. If you ever make your way to Agmar, know you have friends in the city. He nods and then turns away very quickly so that you cannot see any emotion that may or may not be <laughs> presenting on his face. <laughs> and these giant birds kick up this big cloud of dust and take off into the night. You guys are in pretty hilly terrain. You can see again this small bit of mountains off in the distance. But for tonight, you may camp. I have been curious. For you guys, is there a set chore list? <laughs> <laughs> Are there jobs that every that I do this job every single night? Or is it like, well, it's Thursday, so that means it's Checker's turn to build the fire. I will say, I think every time the party gets ready to camp for the night, they pull out the chore list, and Checker's is just, like, suspiciously not around. <laughs> <laughs> every time. So they've, really, they've just stopped looking for him. They're like, all right, Checker's, fine. You got out of this one. I feel like... Catherine's job is both to make like the earthen table that we all like yeah. sit around, but also to like get out the tent and do all of like the little fiddly like yeah. fiberglass, <laughs> like get all the tent Perfect. set up and it takes like two hours and it just sucks. <laughs> is Caskrin very well practiced at this, or does he is that just his job? I wanna say it's both. Because totally. <laughs> he has probably been doing this for, mm -hmm. you know, decades exactly. at this point <laughs> right, like, exactly. out on patrol but it just it never gets any easier <laughs> it's just like putting a puzzle together where the puzzles change every time you like the pieces change every time you look at and they, it and they keep I, coming up with these new fangled tents yeah, and oh yeah, this one's different I, I feel like Val's asked like I'm like hey Cass do you need help and he's just been like frustrated Got at that this, point yeah. like no I, I'm fine this is my cross to bear <laughs> I imagine <laughs> I imagine that to make things easier Val has also tried to label sections. Absolutely. So you, you connect like A to A, B to B. But I also imagine that one of Checker's favorite activities oh. is to take mm. is to dismantle the tent and occasionally change B and C. Yeah. Or change A and D. Or you know. Mm. And so even though this worked yesterday, yeah. this worked last night, why don't these two pieces fit together anymore? And there was just a scene like a couple nights ago where he's got two of those like long ten pieces pieces in his hand just shouting towards the sky <laughs> damn you tent makers <laughs> the saint you cut you curse yeah. the name yeah. of the saint of tents <laughs> i also kind of picture that cash puts it together sized essentially for a dwarf mm -hmm. so self is always yeah. in his tent <laughs> yeah. bent over and, and like, oh, like crawling in this is how the tent came i don't know yeah. this is what you do with tents mm -hmm. What are those, those missing pieces over on the corner? <laughs> Don't worry about those. Just shoves them off into the distance, right into the those, fire. With those them. are optional. Those yeah, are right. always optional. There's always optional. Like, I'll come with extra pieces, you know, just in case. <laughs> but as you guys are putting things together and are kind of doing your nightly checklist and doing your, your various responsibilities, it becomes very obvious that you are one travel companion down. As you are sitting around the fire, as you're sitting around this table, you feel the you feel the lack of the the terrible presence and terrible aura of the fortunate. 
but you all are able to make camp and are able to just settle in for the evening. So I imagine we're all sitting around this table after, you know, maybe an hour of getting the camp ready and we've got some tea and we've maybe finished dinner and we're just winding down for the night. Kaskrin goes to his backpack and he pulls out the handkerchief again, holding the pieces of the armband and kind of like spreads them out across the table this time, looking at them with a renewed determination Mm -hmm. in his eyes. And this is the band from the member of the bones that you guys are kind of, that is the driver of this quest to see if you can repair it and hopefully help out some members of the bones. Right. And so he takes the, the handkerchief and puts all these metal pieces next to each other, trying to organize them again in a way that makes sense. And he says to, to everyone, we've learned a lot these past few nights. I think we need to take a minute and really understand what we're doing, understand what we know, so that we can know where we're going. And so Caspian draws a dot on the table and labels it the smoke creature. The first creature that we encountered on our travels outside of Agmar. And next to it, he puts a couple of labels based on what we know. You know, creature of rage, creature of anger, and the creature that first untethered the bones. And next to that dot, Checkers just puts a little flame symbol with an angry face on it and a scepter. <laughs> I made it better. Casco <laughs> <laughs> just like looks at it and like, it is better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and towards like the very top, indicating what started all of this, he draws another line right towards the shepherd. The shepherd was, by his account, the creature who summoned these smoke creatures, these first ones, he called them. And next to them are the ice creatures that came through the portal. It seems that the shepherd is is doing some sort of coordination. He's maybe a a leader in this war. And Checkers kind of takes his stick and kind of draws a line from (laughs) the shepherd and just draws a whole bunch of little angry frog faces, one with a large crown. And he said he brought the grung too, right? He's the one that brought the grung that we're attacking that caravan we were on. So it seems like the shepherd is somehow in the middle of this glorious war. But what do we know about him? The shepherd is a furbolg, a former guild member. To be confirmed with the proper paperwork, but <laughs> in theory, yes. Val will then, as she places down the golden tree badge with the shepherd's hook symbol on it, draws a line or another dot to note the portal left open in the druid's uh, field. This symbol was seen on the, the elf who opened the portal in the druid's grove. This is a problem with creatures that can turn themselves into other things. <laughs> Is all of this just the shepherd? Could be. They, you know, were among us for a full day as Amber. We didn't even know. They could be anyone. They are immensely powerful. They've, you know, before the battle, they stopped time. That is magic seemingly lost. Because no one has been powerful enough for decades, possibly, to cast it. When you saw the shepherd sitting in a cave, you caught a glimpse of the outside of the cave. Any idea where that was? You can roll me a survival check if you'd like. Guided? Yeah, you (laughs) 
Friggin' cleric, Reza, Reza. Four for my guidance, so 18 on the die, but you said survival, right? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Yowza. Uh, survival, that's gonna be... Oh, wait, a- no, like, sir, I could be a... Oh, it's not a negative. I didn't drop any stats. Oh, it's a plus four, actually. Yeah. Oh, hey. <laughs> 26. I didn't realize it was a wisdom. You're fine, is the point. <laughs> you, you, would, you would know and would have known in the instant that it is not anywhere near here. And as you are sitting here right now, very purposefully thinking and trying to be like, okay, what is it? And you're praying over it and you're really reflecting. There were mountains in the background, but they were not the same kind of mountain that you find here on the Emerald Range where you guys are, where Agmar is kind of at the foothills of and where basically all of the local area is. This was a mountain range on another continent. And so Castrid goes back to the dot indicating the shepherd and next to it, you know, there's the guild badge. Maybe there's the four badges of the guilders that were mm-hmm. lost. There's the word amber. There's the word elf with a question mark. And under that, he scrawls in the word immortal? Question mark? Question mark? Question mark. <laughs> it's definitely possible the vision or visions I had started with the shepherd much younger, meditating outside of a portal in a cave, the same portal they now wield. And then it moved to, it's so hard to tell, but felt decades later when they went and tried to fight the altar giant and even though that time had passed and it's hard to describe but in the vision they just felt the shepherd felt more powerful than before they were still useless against the altar giant Selv, because you are trained in nature, based on what Val tells you about kind of the scenery of this kind of meditation thing, the way that the stalactites and stalagmites are different and kind of the natural erosion of a cave and that kind of stuff, which you would know being someone who lived a lot in mountain, a mountainous area, it is decades, if not longer rocks like that do not form quickly so it could be decades or even centuries even still they describe themselves as a mortal and that they were fighting on our side and he mentioned a lot of other things during our battle so maybe what else do we know he knows he knows about the gods. He knows about the Eternal Citadel. He knows about the Ultra Giants. He knows about Vakri and the Quarry. He knows the words of power from the old Golden Tree Guild. The first ones? The second ones. (laughs) Speaking of things that are really, really old. (laughs) Checkers draws... Burn! (laughs) Checkers is going to draw a line from the Shepherd... And he's going to point it towards a big flying lizard. <laughs> I like the idea that you've just been drawing it in the background. Yeah, yeah. All this, all this, all this it's very detailed, happening. surprisingly. <laughs> Talv, I thought the shepherd knew something about dragons. And they might have been even old enough to see one. And we all saw what the shepherd saw in your dream, trance, vision. We all saw what happened to you at the monastery, Self. Oh. The main purpose of the monastery is to protect those eggs. I will answer any questions that you may have, but I ask that you keep the knowledge of the existence of the eggs at the monastery to yourselves. Of course. I got the impression that the shepherd didn't know that before, didn't know the purpose of the monastery. The monastery itself is 
ages old and secretive, so they might not have ventured to that part of Rixia. But it seems that the shepherd does have an immense well of knowledge. And also, is your monastery the only one that's protecting these eggs? Is Kavo secretly sitting on an egg somewhere protecting it? <laughs> that would be I... a sight. <laughs> <laughs> but not, he wasn't originally. Huh? <laughs> yeah. I would say that's doubtful that he himself is sitting on an egg <laughs> and protecting it. Let me have my happy place. <laughs> <laughs> it's possible that his monastery may have some. I don't know the extent of the distribution of any remaining eggs. Is there any chance, Selv, that the shepherd goes after the monasteries next? We know that he knows about the location of the Druid Circle now. I presume that they're on their way now, but maybe afterwards with this new knowledge. It could be if it factors into any of their plans. They may have no plans for need any eggs mm-hmm. whatsoever, in which case it's just another thing they know, but nothing to act on. Agreed. But I still feel I should warn the monastery somehow. We saw someone in that vision taking an egg out of the monastery. Do you know who that was? No. Do you know what that cool sword they had was? <laughs> I know it hurt. <laughs> <laughs> it did seem quite vicious. But I, I don't know anything about it. That was maybe something else that could be researched. Because it does seem like a relatively unique item. Val has just like one notebook that's just like two research. Yeah. That's it. Just <laughs> yep. like bullet points. And now, a word from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Veil of the Void. Veil of the Void is a critically acclaimed sci-fi TTRPG emphasizing creativity and custom storytelling. Its newest expansion, Yggdrasil, infuses the setting with Nordic flavor, bringing 10 new classes and species to the infinite cosmos, as well as an entirely new runic enchantment system. Start your adventure among the stars as a godling or Etten, and level up your character as a berserker, spirit caller, rhapsodist, and so much more. Veil of the Void Yggdrasil is available now on Kickstarter, and supporting it gets you both the core book and this expansion for free. Don't wait. Sail through the stars with Veil of the Void Yggdrasil. Check out Veil of the Void on Kickstarter today and learn more about the project on Linktree at Veil of the Void. Hello again, everyone. It's me, DM Nathan, and welcome to the mid-roll. This is where we remind you to follow us on all the social medias, particularly on Twitter, at Reckless underscore Attack, where we are posting memes and behind-the-scenes things and all the best types of promos and nonsense. And if you are enjoying and want to support what we're doing, please consider supporting us over on Patreon. It is one of the best ways to help us improve the show and let us do cool new things. If you're interested in repping Reckless Attack out in the real, actual meat space world, please head over to Redbubble and TeePublic, which you can find through our website, where we have all kinds of awesome merch, stickers, t-shirts, maybe towels, and I think maybe even like a shower curtain, all kinds of stuff, and we update it very frequently, usually with the neatest, coolest new designs and pieces of art that we've commissioned. It is also a great way to help spread the word about Reckless Attack and get cool frogs on more of your possessions, which isn't that what we all want? That's all from me, and now, back to the episode. And at the very end, much like we were able to see into Selv's worst day, we saw the shepherds too. We saw him 
fighting against the Ultra Giant. We saw him doing everything that he could, throwing his hands to the sky and shouting that the gods had forsaken us and that we weren't enough ourselves, begging the gods to come back. He must know more about the gods and where they went than we do, than the histories tell us. Do you think that was immediately upon their departure? Or was he just calling out to ask them to come back? They were calling out after they fought the Ultra Giant, which was ages, centuries after the gods left and even the saints departed. The shepherd is an undeterminate age. They could have maybe overlapped with the saints, but then that goes back to the question, is the shepherd immortal? Selv is going to um, reach over and pick up the the drawn stick (laughs) Um, and basically just kind of trace a little line parallel to the first ones, parallel to the smoke creature, uh, parallel to the grung and draw a line out and at the end of it, draw a little skull with antlers and label it Mothman. Maybe they walked into the city under the guise of someone else and summoned the Mothman. We know it was summoned from somewhere within the city. This is true. We know whoever did it must have been powerful to bypass the city's defenses. And to summon more than one. So, what was notable was that not that there was one Mothman summoned on each of the knights, but that at the end, at the final confrontation, was there were many Mothmen. And that was never in any of the research that Selv and Val did, never ever happened. Like, it was all, always one final kind of entity that was the kind of harbinger of, okay. of mm-hmm. the doom. So, Checkers is going to grab the drawing stick from Selv. Hey, <laughs> hey, I'm sick. <laughs> and just draw, like, a squiggly line from the Mothman that you put down back all the way to the first ones. And from there, extend a line towards Vakri. So, the first ones, there's a whole bunch of them. We fought the ice creatures, we fought the smoke creature. Who knows, maybe even the Mothman is the first one. But Val, Vakri's the first one too, right? And the creatures that we fought in your mind palace, those were also the first ones. Yeah. They are all the first ones. Vakri is of a division, a group of first ones called the Quarry who broke from others. Vakri in fact looks more like the first ones but is able to take on a form similar to mortals so that when I was younger was not afraid. Our connection is built kind of to suit what my brain understands. So maybe the shepherd has one of these bad Vakris in his head. That could be. I don't know. It could be many things. There are many reasons the shepherd could be opening these portals and bringing these creatures to our plane. We saw their worst day of them cursing the gods, and I feel that that is a catalyst, a spark that may have started what is now building to a tumultuous ultimate war. So, 
I think it turns out we know a lot, actually. I think the question is, what do we want to do with this information? We can't fight them ourselves, but we also can't let the shepherd do whatever they're doing. They're causing havoc. They're hurting people. They're hurting our friends. I've been sending messages to my mom and the illustrious Atheum. It's always helpful to get more research. I've been keeping Berga up to date. I'm sure she's talked to Nam. So it's not just us. We have others ready to help. I can always keep Juniper informed as well. I only get so much (laughs) to message, but, you know, we're not alone in this. But I don't know if we can or even should fight them. I don't know that we're strong enough. And Checkers pulls out from underneath his cloak the black raven mount pack that was given to us and sets it down in the center of the table that we've been working on. And sticking out of it is the cracked helmet of the fortunate. And as Checkers does so, he says, I don't know about you, Cass, but I know what I want to do. I don't think it matters if we're strong enough. We have to. We may not be strong enough by ourselves, but if we gather enough allies, I believe any evil can be brought down. It cast looks at everyone and doesn't really know how to feel. Because it feels like everyone is ready to move forward, but Cass is still held back by fear, by what he saw. But at the end of it, he says to everyone, but mostly to himself, we have to. We have to fight him somehow by finding allies, by growing stronger, by becoming more. Can Val do like an insight check? Or does even Cass share his fear? Valeska, in your... You know, with your extremely high <laughs> passive insight, <laughs> would notice that Cassgrin tenses up and tries to hide against things of overwhelming power, against the Ultra Giants, against you know now the Shepherd. It's not something in his mind he thinks that he can defeat, and so he chooses not to. Wanting to address Cass's fear and understanding where it comes from, what happened in Lotros, and what Cass saw firsthand and had to fight through, and really not even fight, but survive. She wants to offer Cass, like, comfort in this insurmountable situation and say that Though we say all these things, we say that we have a plan, there's still a fear of failure. And we saw how close we came to that with the Mothman and the consequences. What would have happened had we not been there, had we not succeeded? It seems like that may happen at a larger scale. We talk about doing more research, gaining more allies. We say that because that's what we can do. That's our plan to move forward. And it still might not be enough. But we have to do what we can with that fear weighing on us. That's how I feel. I am afraid but a plan and a list do do help me feel better. They help me manage my anxiety. (laughs) (laughs) Then maybe we just 
take the next step and see where the rest of them come. We know we have to find Lorana. We know that the answers to where they might be will be in this giant graveyard in the mountains where we find ourselves. Maybe that's all we do. We just rest up and go for adventure tomorrow. Sounds like a plan, Cass. And he makes another list in (laughs) the table (laughs) Mm -hmm. to help him manage his own anxiety. (laughs) You guys wind down for the evening. You start to go through the motions of getting ready and settle in. Kaskrin, as you are in your whatever, I don't remember if we've established what level of comfort Kaskrin travels in. Uh, not a bed, unfortunately, but... Kaskrin has set up his own, like, cot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> as you're settling into the most comfortable travel cot money you molded, can buy. molded the earth mm-hmm. around the cot. Mango just comes over and lays on top of you. Right. <laughs> as he does every night. Yeah. yeah. And what is what is different tonight is that in addition to the clammy warmth of a mango on top of you. Worth it. <laughs> <laughs> Ugh, just having to rotate out pajamas because they're all froggy. Um, it takes you a while to notice it. And it's kind of that in-between space as you're about to fall asleep and your mind is really starting to shut down and your thoughts are starting to go away. You feel a warmth inside of you. It is a warmth that reminds you of a feeling you got very early in this journey as a gilder. That warmth and that space inside of you that called you into the forest off the runic roads all those many months ago to find the dryad, to learn about the grung, to see a glimpse of the shepherd even back then though you didn't quite realize what you were witnessing. That space that you associate with the Eternal Citadel just feels like there is a hearth that has been stoked a little bit and is just adding a little extra heat. You guys wake up as the new day breaks You pick up camp. You do all the morning chores, which we do not need to get into the details of, at least in this session. Ah, He's freaking tense. (laughs) (laughs) No, that's that's, that's Checkers' job to fuck up the tents. You guys start walking. And again, it's not a huge mountain range, but it is obviously still a good number of mountains. And the Raven Mounts kind of dropped you off a good ways outside of it just for kind of safety and vantage purposes. But it's a couple hour walk, no problem. I'm gonna say who has the highest passive perception? 17? 16. Both pretty good. (laughs) Both pretty good, but I'm gonna let checkers have the out loud reaction to it, even though Selv also sees it at roughly the same time. As you guys are kind of looking at this mountain, checkers, you notice partway up the mountain. Something emerges is the word I'm going to use, for lack of a better one. And you see a little activity. And then you kind of squint, and it seems like something is coming towards you. As you see a, not just a rock, but you see very obviously a boulder firing towards you guys. How do you react? (laughs) I wondered what that thing was coming towards me. And then it hit me. Yeah. (laughs) Uh Yes. So Checkers, as he's looking at this boulder come hurtling towards all of us, just yell out to everyone, there's a boulder hurtling towards (laughs) us. Right, yeah. There's a boulder hurtling towards us. Uh I was going to say, Cass, I found your family. It's coming towards us. <laughs> <laughs> what? And, Where? And in that moment, Self also notices it. How do you guys... Uncle Ben! <laughs> no, no, no. I, I just... I, checkers just going, 
hey, Cass, uh, hypothetically speaking, if there was an enormous <laughs> boulder coming right. towards you, what would you want me to shout yeah. in order to get you to uh, get out of the way? <laughs> you guys all, again, in this moment, again, Selv, you also see it pretty much the same time. He was just that split second to be like, ah, Checkers gets to say something now. <laughs> How do you guys react again in this moment? Like, what does it look like? Are you guys diving? I just try to get out of the way of the ball. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, just I, scatter immediately. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I yell, scatter. And then uh, <laughs> we all run in different directions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, can't, it can't chase all of us. <laughs> and, and, and this giant, again, and the closer it comes, and you guys can all see it now, it is sizable. Like, it is the size of one of you guys, if not larger. It is arcing towards you and hurtling at a very uh, horrifying speed, but its arc takes it so that it lands a couple hundred feet in front of you guys and rolls towards you and actually comes to a stop maybe 30, 50 feet away from where you guys were (laughs) pre-scattering. And you guys see that there is writing on it that seems to be scrawled on maybe like a a piece of chalk or maybe just a rock scraping against another rock. But there is clearly some something written on it in a language that is not one that you all know. Val, you read a message that uh, for many reasons does not immediately make sense to you. Scrawled On this boulder, it says, The ghost who walks under the earth approaches. Prepare. What? And as you guys are all taking in this strange scene. Guys, prepare for something underground to come to us. I don't know. Val, you see a ethereal spectral tendril snake up right behind Checkers. Checkers, look out! Ah. And that is where we will pick up next week, everybody. Yay! We gotta wait now? We We have to wait! (laughs) Dungeons and Dragons is good. The day is winding down. You guys have, you know, again, we're skipping forward a little bit. Checkers has already been uh, cuffed upside the head <laughs> by at least, we'll say, one to three members of we, the we Adventuring We got in the line Guild. to do this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why you're doing this. Mango's fine. Look at him. I, ah. think, I, I think Val actually was at the front of the line and at the back of the line. Right. <laughs> I was going to say, there were probably maybe a repeat or two. Val would honestly probably, instead of like physically hurting him, just send oh. um, Mind Sliver of her pain <laughs> at watching Mango fall to his death. And like, on repeat, like a couple of times. <laughs> all right, all right, again. I won't do it again. Probably. Probably. Unless it needs... Unless I have to. He was really cool, though. <laughs> yeah. I want to. <laughs> so you guys are, are back 